Mora conducts physician-led support groups, helping people live healthier, happier lives, free from chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And on our podcast, Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus, we bring to you nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests to empower and inspire you with their knowledge and stories of plant-based lifestyle so that you can be your healthiest self. All right. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'm really honored to have a friend of mine, Chandler Rosenberg. How are you today? I'm good. It's so great to be here with you. Oh, well, thank you for coming. And we met through Plant Based Utah and all the wonderful things that those guys are doing in the wonderful state of Utah. Um, it's a definitely a passion project for you and Patrick and all those amazing, your dad. Um, so yeah. it's fabulous. Um, but before we get there, I really want to dive into you're a young woman who's active and making things happen locally. And on a state level, I mean, it's just pretty cool. So let's let's talk a little bit just about who Chandler is, and then we can start getting into all your work and maybe be inspiration for other young people. Cool. Yeah. Um, again, thank you for having me. Um, I let's see, where should we start? So I grew up here in Utah. Um, my dad, uh, who's also involved with Plant Based Utah, is a physician, and he's always, although he wasn't always tuned into plant based, he's been interested in preventive health my whole life. So I got a lot of that as a kid, kind of probably more than most, like we had a lot of, um, you know, our cereals couldn't be above a certain number of grams of sugar. And he would always say cheese is butter in disguise. So I kind of got like the nutrition uh, brainwashing a little bit. So I always had this, you know, proclivity towards health and um, was interested, but but not really. Uh, And then when I was in high school, I saw a documentary called A Place at the Table up at the Sundance Film Festival that talked about um, food access and kind of food insecurity in the United States, which was honestly something that I had not been exposed to as a teenager very much, um, was not aware of the scale of food insecurity in the United States. And they really kind of point to the food system as um, a driver of a lot of that. And they kind of tell, you know, various stories of folks dealing with uh, both food insecurity, hunger, and chronic disease, and some, in some cases, obesity. And so in my brain, I was just like, that doesn't make sense. You know, we've got a food system problem. Um, And I think that was my senior year of high school. So I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to study. And like, right then and there, I was like, I want to do food policy. I think Marion Nessel was on the, the movie, and I had never been introduced to her before, but she's kind of like invented this field of food policy. She's incredible. Um, And so I went on to study policy uh, at the University of Virginia uh, with an interest in food, but they didn't have any, you know, food specific courses. Um, I've also been interested in the climate. And so um, kind of looked at that as well. And then I moved back to Utah in 2017 and uh, started working. That's kind of when plant-based Utah was um, coming into fruition. Uh, and yeah, we just kind of went from there and I, uh, have been with plant-based Utah since then, since 2017. Um, and we've now kind of, uh, expanded a little bit and I'm working on a few different things. So, okay. So let's, so you have the plant-based Utah gig. What are your other gigs that you're working on and all the, cause <laughs> yeah, got my hands you're, in a few different buckets. You're very multidimensional. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, plant-based Utah, I'm doing that part-time. Our primary thrust there is education, especially for um, healthcare providers, trying to bring more providers in and kind of get them using food as medicine, especially plant-based or plant-forward nutrition. So uh, we do an annual symposium. As uh, as you know, you were our keynote this year. Um, It's great to have you. So we've got that and we've been kind of going on um, at that rhythm uh, since 2017, primarily just this education. And then uh, when the pandemic hit and all of our in-person stuff was canceled, we were kind of like, okay, well, what do we do now? Um, And I was of course paying attention to the news and just kind of reading a lot about the food system and had had this feeling even before the pandemic that we needed to kind of expand our work into food access um, because it's like, you know, it's great to tell people the benefits of a plant-based diet, but I think there are a lot of people that either want to eat that way, they know it's good for them and they don't have access um, or it's just not convenient. And so I was really interested in thinking about how can we kind of take a systems approach and just make this 
easier for people? How can we just provide access to healthy food? We may not even have to tell people, you know, the science behind the diet. If we just give them the food, then they're eating it. Um, so I was thinking about that. And then I came upon a grant uh, from the Center for Nutrition Studies, T. Colin Campbell's organization, um, that was looking to fund like food access or regenerative agriculture projects. But the deadline was the following week. <laughs> Uh, and so I was like, okay, we can't come up with our own programming in one week. So I kind of scoured the local landscape and found an organization called the Village Cooperative that was, um, they had just started the year before, I think this was 2019. And they had started a backyard farm in a low on income neighborhood here in Salt Lake. And they use a thirds model. So they sell a third of what they grow through a CSA. Um, so anyone that wants to sign up and get a weekly veggie box. They donate a third to volunteers. So anyone that wants to come and help out throughout the season um, can take home some veggies. And then they give a third away for free um, through, initially it was a free farm stand and now it's through community partnerships. So I love that model. And I just called them and I was like, hey, there's this grant. If we get it, can we do another backyard garden? Um, so we got it. We did two more gardens that year. Let's see, that was 2020. And then we did two more in 2021 and two more in 2022. So now we're up to six or seven. Um, so that was kind of, you know, exactly what we were looking for at the time, like plant-based Utah kind of wanted to get more involved in the community. Um, but from there, uh, let's see, this is summer of 2021. We had just a lot of like climate disaster news here in Utah. I mean, the drought was kind of ramping up. Um, we had smoke for the entire month of August. We couldn't really go outside without feeling sick. And I was just like devastated about the climate. And I was so frustrated because I was like, no one understands this food climate link. You know, growing food's going to become more and more difficult um, in Utah. And I think in much of the West, like the majority of our water in this drought, 80% is going towards agriculture, but I knew I'm like, that's not the kind of agriculture that we want. And we need more good agriculture. We need less of this bad agriculture. Like who's thinking about this? Um, so I just started to call people. I called the Utah Department of Agriculture. I called Utah State Extension. Um, anyone I could think of working in local food to just try and figure out like who was thinking holistically about you know food, community, health, climate. Um, and I wasn't super satisfied with what I found. Everyone was kind of like, oh yeah, that's kind of beyond our scope or, you know, our job's just to help farmers make money. And that looks like alfalfa or export agriculture. Um, so kind of hearing some of that. And then uh, through the partnership with the village cooperative, we started working with some more small farmers and uh, found out, you know, our small farmers are really struggling. And so we just thought like, okay, what can we do to kind of bring support um, give a stronger voice to local agriculture and these small farmers, offer more education for the community around, you know, this food climate health link, because there's really no place to go for that type of education. And um, at Plant Based Utah, you know, we've been doing the nutrition education, but uh, very little of kind of the food system stuff. And so we decided this was fall of 2021 to organize a Utah Food Coalition. Um, so in the beginning, we just got a group of small farmers together and we were just like, here's our ideas. You know, we want to educate the community. We want to bring people and connect people around food. And we want to eventually advocate for local policy that, you know, brings support for small farmers, local food. Um, and they were all on board. They were like, you know, we've been wanting something like this. We just don't have the capacity to do it. And I thought, well, great. Like, I'm not a farmer. I've got the capacity to kind of do some of this organizing stuff. So um, it's been going great since then. I mean, we, in the first year, I reached out to some other food system coalitions across the country to just kind of be like, what are you guys doing? You know, how are you doing it? And um, shared some of my ideas. In the beginning, I had like big dreams to do a food system week where we just bring everyone together, talk about all these different issues, all the ways the food system, you know, is related to greenhouse gases, health, climate, animal agriculture. Um, and I talked to someone with the Food Systems Leadership Network and they were like, okay, great ideas, but slow down. <laughs> like you should spend the first year or two um, really just kind of building relationships within the local food system. So that's been the focus uh, with the Food Coalition for the last year now, year plus. Um, we did some small farmer potlucks last year to just kind of provide a space for small farmers to connect and learn from each other. Uh, we do a bi-monthly local food forum. So it's 
similar to the small farmer potlucks, but anyone from Utah State, Department of Agriculture, if you've got a local market, um, if you're like a local chef, we just want everyone in food to kind of come together and start trying to identify, you know, what are our problems? What gaps are we seeing and how can we work together, share resources, things like that. Um, and then to do a little bit of community engagement, we've started to do a food skills workshop series. So we'll just, you know, partner with a different like local maker um, or local educator to talk about or teach a different food skill, really just trying to kind of bring people back to the fact that, you know, food comes from the earth. <laughs> it's, it's, um, yeah, just this connection point for all of us to each other, to our communities, and I think to the land. So that's the Food Coalition. Um, shortly after we started the Food Coalition, I connected with somebody in town who uh, was worried about the drying of the Great Salt Lake. So I don't know how many folks have followed that news. We've gotten some great national coverage recently, um, but the Great Salt Lake is drying up rapidly and threatening all of our health here in Utah because the lake for decades, maybe even centuries has been collecting chemicals, you know, agricultural runoff. Um, we've got arsenic, naturally high levels of arsenic here in our soils in Utah. So the lake has just been like gathering all of this. And as it dries up because it's so shallow, it reveals this toxic lake bed. The wind picks up the toxic lake bed and blows toxic dust into the valley where most of people here in Utah live. So um, yeah, it's an environmental crisis. And um, about a month after we started the Food Coalition, I helped start a group called Save Our Great Salt Lake, just kind of trying to bring awareness and see what we could do to um, engage people on this. It's not really something that people knew about like a year and a half ago that the lake was even drying up. Um, we've come a long way since, but uh, we're really just focused on trying to kind of connect the different groups and nonprofits working in the space who want to talk about Great Salt Lake and then making it really easy for the community to engage. So sometimes when they see the headlines or, you know, things coming out of the Capitol or the legislature, it's a little bit confusing. People don't know what they can do. And so we've really tried to just make it easy for folks um, and, you know, talk about the different issues, why the lake's drying up, um, which I find interesting. It's actually all kind of comes back to agriculture because 80% of our water here in Utah um, is going to agriculture. 60% is alfalfa to feed uh, cattle and especially dairies. And about a quarter of it is exported to Asia for their growing uh, meat industry. So kind of all comes back to the plant-based food system. So you're having a water crisis in the state of Utah is selling the water? Who's selling the water? I guess I'm a little confused. So farmers here in the West, the way the water law works is uh, first in time, first in right. So the first people that got here have the first rights to the water. And those are mostly farmers. So um, yeah, it's just farmers that are growing hay using a majority of the water and then selling it. I mean, a lot of the hay does stay locally, but uh, at least a quarter is exported to Asia. So they're, they're exporting the, the hay, not necessarily They're exporting the, the hay, gotcha. yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So when you say it's drying up, it's because the water's <clears throat> being utilized for 80% of it, this animal agriculture, which we already know is one unhealthy for the physical human body, but it's unhealthy for the earth, the climate, right. on and on. Who, who's addressing it besides you guys are just bringing light to the situation. You're shining a light on this issue. Like is, what is the yeah. discussion of solutions and action? So because, well, a lot has changed since we started. I think not just because of us. I think, you know, once the word got out, we started our group because we heard a podcast, our local NPR station did like a state and fate of the lake. They said the words toxic dust bowl. And we were just like, no one's talking about this. Wow. Um, there are other groups that have been either engaged in water policy or um, have been working out on the lake. There's a great group, Friends of Great Salt Lake. Um, but I think no one really understood the scale of the crisis, I guess. And so it's just been really this like kind of experiment or exercise and like, how can we bring the community together in new ways to address this very local, very tangible climate threat, which, I mean, that's been a big and a very interesting piece of it for me, to be totally honest. I was not like, I haven't spent a lot of time out of Great Salt Lake. I used to row out there my senior year of high school, but um, growing up in Utah, it's like not a place that people 
you know, celebrate. They say it's stinky, you know, it's like there's bugs. And so they kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, we, we really don't celebrate the lake. And so most Utahns don't grow up with this like love and concern for the lake. But um, I feel like it really is kind of this opportunity to figure out how we're going to collaborate and work together um, for, you know, climate challenges ahead. Mm. So yes, oh. since we've started, um, we've got a coalition now of like all of the local nonprofits in the environmental space that meets weekly to kind of talk about, you know, how we can share messaging, how we can collaborate to advocate for policy. Um, the legislative session just started. So we had a big rally last week and are um, making sure people know how they can get engaged. We're going to be doing weekly lobby days up at the state house and things like that. But mm. yeah, it's an all hands on deck moment mm. for us. Wow. So basically, yeah, you're saying it's out of sight, out of mind. And it's like kind of like you don't know the blessing you have until it's gone. And you're like, hmm, okay. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I okay. think it's just like, I don't know, Utah was founded by the pioneers or the pioneers, you know, arrived here and settled, of course, it's stolen land. Um, but there was this like idea that it was, you know, their birthright or their calling to irrigate the desert and mm -hmm. green the desert. And it's like, we're running into the end of that myth that that mm. you know works like they used to believe that as they plow the rains will come and it's just like that's absolutely not true like we have to start treating this like it is a desert right. um, and I think like back in the day it was like okay how are we gonna profit off of this land and agriculture cattle makes sense you know like that's a it's an easy thing to do and I mean alfalfa which is what a lot of people are growing that uses so much water um, is a really easy thing to grow. Like it's, mm. I've, I've started to have conversations with farmers. I mod actually moderated a panel on water last week at our Utah Farm and Food Conference with some of these alfalfa farmers. Um, because in the beginning, I used to think like, well, what if we just get all these alfalfa farmers to start growing plant-based foods? Um, and I'm still pushing that. Like I would love to explore, you know, the opportunity for them to switch to legumes or beans or chickpeas or whatever makes sense. But I've since learned that like growing vegetables is very different than growing alfalfa. Growing alfalfa, they kind of call it like the lazy man's agriculture where you can just like get on a tractor, you know, spray your water. You don't have to do a lot. Whereas the, you know, the growing of plant-based foods, fruits and vegetables, especially takes a lot more labor and, you know, care and you can't have the scale that, that you have with these monocrop systems. Mm, wow. And so what do the farmers say? Like, what are your learnings from all this? Like, what do you feel like are the highlights to the work yeah. that you're doing? I mean, it's been interesting because this is like a topic that it doesn't seem like folks have been willing to address for a long time. Like when we got started, um, we were talking to a local water policy group and I was like, well, what about agriculture? If 80% of our water is going to agriculture, isn't that something we should shift? And they were kind of just like, oh, it's a political third rail. Like we can't even go there. And I'm like, what do you mean we can't go there? We have to go there. Like maybe it was political suicide 10 years ago, but it's going to be actual suicide if we don't <laughs> go there, you know? Like, like exactly. I think, yeah, there's just, there's a really, we've got a really polite political culture here in Utah. Mm. Um, Another example, like at one of our local food advisory meetings, somebody called it the A word alfalfa because it's just this thing where it's like, you can't criticize our heritage, you can't criticize our tradition. We've been doing this for generations, and so this really is the very like beginning of these conversations. But uh, I am seeing like you know a shift and kind of a willingness on the part of farmers. I think what a lot of people miss, there's kind of this battle in the headlines where it's like the news will come out and be like, we've got a you know, get rid of all the alfalfa farms to save Great Salt Lake. Getting rid of alfalfa is the only thing that'll save the lake, but there's no attention given to like, okay, how are we going to do that in a way that is just for the farmers and kind of respects that these are people um, who have a livelihood, they have a tradition, they live in a rural community where there may not be many other economic opportunities. And so we have to really kind of like come together on this rather than attack each other. And it's, I think, because people are so fired up at the lake, um, there has been a little bit of a, just like, who cares about the farmers? They're stealing all our water. And it's like, it's really not like that. Like they want to help. They want to be part of the solution. Um, so I've been going to 
the local, it's called the Agricultural Water Optimization Task Force. And initially I was extremely disappointed because they were just like, well, what kind of technology can we you know, find that's gonna reduce our water? But uh, more and more they're like, okay, we realize we have to consider growing other crops. We just need support to A, figure out what those might be. Um, so we need money for research. And B, we need support finding new markets. And so that's really been where I'm interested in where bringing it back to the Food Coalition, I'm having a lot of conversations with folks um, on like, how can we provide these new markets so that we can encourage you know, local farmers, more people to get into local farming and grow these healthier, more plant-based foods. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So you're coming up with solutions on a community scale, which is great, especially, mm -hmm. especially uh, fascinating to me is that you're a young person who saw this and you did it's like you almost like it's like when you start something and you're new and you're young you don't know quite the depth the breadth and depth right. that you're walking into and all of the you know the the things you can't see because it's dark of the unknown but then you're like in the middle of it you're like oh my goodness but then you speak to people you're like you've been here for all these years why can't yeah. we well, why haven't this been addressed? And I think that the problem that we're seeing both with, you know, food, with the Great Salt Lake and with just like climate and a lot of these challenges generally is just that everyone is used to kind of their siloed approach, their specialized approach. You know, we talk about this in medicine all the time. Like we're, you know, you're a specialist. I'm not thinking about nutrition. Um, so everyone's just kind of done their narrow thinking and no one's doing anything wrong but they just don't see it as their role to be able to like zoom out and then start kind of figuring out how we can work together. And so I feel like a lot of what we've been doing both through the food coalition and like through the great salt lake work is just like prodding people like, Hey, no, like this actually is your role. Like you can mm -hmm. decide to think differently about this. Um, so it's been really interesting, but like really cool to see just people coming together in new ways. Mm. That's really interesting. Cause it is similar to lifestyle medicine, right? So you're, you kind of poke, someone learns something or you're poking them kind of like, no, actually, I don't care if you're endocrinologist or cardiologist, a pulmonologist, an orthopedic surgeon, like your dad. Yeah. Every one of these roles should be addressing the root cause of the chronic disease that got the person to where they're at. I mean, it's absolutely the first right. thing we should be addressing. Um, and then it goes, I mean, I would have never thought about you know, our food system and food access. So, and I even grew up in a home that had food access issues, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, I understand that from a personal level, but the piece of it for me was as a physician saying, oh, go eat your fruits and vegetables. Like I didn't, I didn't truly appreciate that till I was actually diving deeper and patients were coming back to me saying, hey, this is really expensive because they were trying to buy the processed foods and then you start going to right. the processed foods and you're learning where the processed food, you know, the companies are aiming at poor neighborhoods because it's cheap. And oh my easy gosh. To get I mean, it's just, it's disgusting. It's terrible. Yeah. Oh it's like, how can we just make it easier for people? Like, I think, I mean, I think we need all of the things at once. And so that's why I'm like, you know, the education that we're doing through Plant Based Utah, giving people the science for those mm -hmm. who can't afford it right now, or, you know, have access, have time, you know, this is the, what the science says, but then for mm -hmm. those who can't, it's just like, how can we, create the food environments that just make this the default or make this mm -hmm. easier for people yep. make the right choice the yeah. easy choice it's really is where it's at but then it comes back to the political leanings and the political pressures like you said that that third mm -hmm. rail that you can't go there I was like so we're just basically we're lying to ourselves to think that we're going to change anything if we don't go address the root cause because we're afraid to like what's going to happen yeah I think what? we've got to like shatter this idea that there's like topics we can't talk about or I mean I think a lot of physicians feel that way like I've had conversations with some folks that are just like I don't know how to you know talk about nutrition with my patients or like I don't want to tell my patients that they're overweight you know like mm. I think um yeah I don't know like food is just so personal yeah, yeah ever. That it's just like not your place but it drives I don't me know. cuckoo it drives <laughs> me utterly insane right you know because um, it's funny because I'll, I'll have conversations like you with, with colleagues or doctors and they're still like, you know, well, we have to meet the patient where they're, I was like, absolutely. But at the same time, you have to tell the patient, you have, Be this honest. is an urgent issue. You have to say this, they're coming to you. You have to say, listen, yeah, I'm not, it's not about 
fat shaming or anything. It's like this, this weight is unhealthy. Diabetes is going to kill you. You know, like you right. have to say, this is the urgent issue. But then of course we have to, I call it quote, almost market it or veil it in the sense that, but what are your, where, what, what would motivate you for that behavior change? Because then there's that behavior peace change, but totally. we have to be honest with ourselves and with, well, with our and patients. I think oh. we have to be honest with the fact that there's a food system that's spending a ton of money to market yep. like candy, sugar, processed food. So it's like, we're not trying to, you know, like control people or boss people around, but people think that like, what is just the natural default? Like, oh, maybe I just like these foods or like, this is just my preference or my body's asking for these foods. Right. It's like, no, there is, there are billions of dollars <laughs> that are putting these foods in your face and there's not right. a whole lot of money on the other side to counter that. So, right. Exactly. Um, and I think kind of the things that I see the trend that does worry me in the plant-based movement is this all the processed plant foods and so then when you're preaching right. this message of health of a plant-based diet they're like oh like you know for example this week I had a patient um <clears throat> and like oh I went and bought these crackers and they're plant-based and vegan and I'm just like okay well you can I'm, get, I'm, yeah. I'm glad you're shifting away from you know the stuff that had maybe dairy or whatever in it and the chips but at the same time, let's talk about what's in that box. You see that list of chemicals yeah. and the foreign names, like that's a better choice, but it's not the best choice. So let's talk about what we can do to replace that. And so, but it's totally. really funny because people are always looking for like, they've become so out of touch with real food that people yeah. feel like I have to replace the cracker. Or I have to replace the donut with something that's equivalent in the whole food place. I'm like, what if we start? we can create some very yummy things, but those are going to be usually higher in calories. They're going to be, you know, dates and maple syrup sweetened. And we're still, it's, it's still looking to replace them. Like, ah, oh, it's so funny. Let's You're like, no, we just have to kind of think differently. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. We're talking a lot about some of the educational programming we want to do this year through plant-based Utah. And we really do want to focus on just like the message of processed, ultra processed foods yes. versus unprocessed foods. And it's like, I think that that can even reach people that maybe aren't vegan or, you know, yeah. aren't plant-based, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think Jessica, our dietitian, brought it up on the, the evening panel we did with clinicians when you were in town, like ultra processed foods have now been classified officially an addictive substance. Right. But it's, wow. yeah, people are just like, well, it's my food choice. So, you know, this is personal and don't shame me. And it's like, these are, I don't know, like the food industry, it's Franken foods. It's not yeah. real food. Yeah, you know, but or like I'll Google like a recipe like plant based this, and they'll have like half a cup of different sugars. And I was like, oh, you know. So it's like, yeah, the messaging is so mixed. That's so again mixed. kind of why like part of me is so drawn to just like the local food movement because mm. it's you know we're talking about like food from the ground. And yeah. to be honest, like a lot of people in our food coalition are not vegan, would never right. be vegan. Um, but we have a potluck, like our small farmer potlucks, and there's like such an array of vegetables and whole foods. Like you would think that people, you know, were all plant-based. Right. Um, but I'm like, I think that this is a great way to, you know, Trojan horse people a little bit, like <laughs> um, talk about the whole foods, talk about, you know, import, how important it is to get foods close to home and um, without chemicals, straight from the ground, straight from the farmer. And then just like by default, uh, they're eating more plant-based. Yeah. And honestly, I think people really enjoy like going to farmer's markets. So they, I For think sure. there's like they, a, a connection point, a relationship yeah, piece. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you can do your local you know, farmers, uh, co-ops and different things and people don't even know. I was really surprised, you know, growing up in a rural community, we always had local stuff, but also in the same sense, um, they just don't know. They've never heard of it. Like, what is a co-op? Right. What do you do? And it's like, oh my goodness, it's really unfortunate that that's not more of a thing. Um, right. But it is expensive, right? Because then those farmers are doing this almost subscription box to try to help support them. So they sell their vegetables and fruits at a little bit higher. It's expensive, unfortunately. You know, it's more expensive than going to Walmart and getting stuff that was trucked in. It's still, you know, in the produce section. So that's, there's that piece too, is the the cost differential. 
Um, yeah, I think we've thing. really got to figure out one. I actually started a new role. I did not mention, um, but <laughs> a new part-time role as of like last week as the Utah Farmers Market Network director. Oh my um, So it's through a USDA grant, uh, basically a coalition or a network of the farmers market managers around the state. And wow. um, a big piece of the grant is, you know, A, just providing this networking for farmers market managers so they can kind of share their experience and support each other. Um, but then helping markets collect data, because right now mm. we do not collect any data, even our biggest markets here in Salt Lake City. Um, and so then we're kind of unable to advocate for local food at the policy level because we're, we just don't have any numbers on like, you know, these are how many jobs we have, or these are how many farmers, or the, this really? is the veggie sales. So we don't have that. And so right now it's like, we go up to the legislature. I think last year they tried to ask for money for farmers markets and the legislature's just like, we don't care. We don't think that this is, you know, anything important. And so- I'm excited to figure out, you know, how we can tell that story, but I do agree. I mean, I think like right now, for the most part, local food shopping at the farmer's market is more expensive. And so mm -hmm. I think we've got to figure out how to, you know, provide some investment, whether it's like state funding for, you know, local markets or support for farmers, like, mm -hmm. I don't know what it looks like and it's probably different for every state but I think at some level we we probably do need some investment in local food to make this accessible to yeah yeah I, I definitely think it'd probably be because I think a California would be different than Utah you know really mm -hmm. easier to grow food in certain places different different cultures absolutely but at this I think the the common thread is people love to get out and go to these places and, and connect to locally. I, cause we're just social creatures it's our community. And, and it's just so fulfilling and it like, yeah. yeah, I get so much joy just like going, even though it is a little bit more of a pain than if I were to just go yeah. to the grocery store every day, like I got to go at a certain time, certain week to pick up my yeah. CSA box, but I usually run into the farmer. We get to chat. Yeah. He's like, Hey, we're doing yoga on the farm on Sunday. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it really is so fulfilling. And I think we all, especially post pandemic, like are craving that kind of community. Mm. And so that's my hope. And like with the food coalition, when we're thinking about community outreach is I'm like, we just got to provide, you know, fun ways for people to engage. And then um, I think it'll be easy to, you know, get them on board with local food. Absolutely. When we lived in Colorado, we had a local CSA and it's always fun to just drive by. It was between Boulder and Longmont. And it just like, that's where my food is coming from every week that I go. It's just, it was just cool. And then they'd follow them on Instagram and they're posting videos of the different things. Yeah. It was just really neat to think like, oh, and that's coming this week. And, you know, you see it, it's you're touching so, it and smell well, it. And it's I, real. To eat seasonally, I think is so mm -hmm. beautiful too. Like, it's so fun when you get your CSA box or you go to the market and you're like, okay, well, this is what they have this week. And then I always have to kind of get crafty and, <laughs> you know, look up some recipes. It does take some extra work. Um, mm -hmm you'll get veggies maybe you didn't you weren't familiar with before like I kohlrabi is pretty new to me <laughs> of the last couple of years um but it's really a very common one in the in the west to in grow. the desert yeah, <laughs> yeah probably so, I, was like, I was definitely a Colorado favorite as well <laughs> yeah I'm like okay yeah I'll roast it I mean everything I just like roast at yeah. 400 in the oven for the most part but, um yeah, I don't know. I love kind of being more in tune with like the rhythms of the season. And mm. that's just, yeah, like bottom line food is something that comes from nature. And I just think we forget that. And there's a lot to gain if we kind of come mm. back to that. I want to circle back around to the backyard farming piece, because I found yeah. that so utterly fascinating. Because when, you know, at the Plant Based Utah panel or symposium this last year, um, it was just I was so fascinated by what they are doing. And then the young woman who was trying to, you know, feed plant-based mm, foods mm -hmm. to those folks on the streets and the, oh, the political struggles in the community. I mean, yeah. she's just, she's just like, okay, fine. One door shuts, another one opens. She, like she is goes, a powerhouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, can we talk about those things? I mean, those are just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the backyard farms, I've just, you know, been running pretty well since we got started. We do six, you know, we channel volunteers at the beginning of the year and we'll have a big volunteer day where we're like prepping the old gardens or installing a new garden. Um, the first garden that the village cooperative did was just in their founder, Darren's backyard. 
And then when we proposed to do a second with the grant that we got, um, we just put out a flyer in the neighborhood and we were like, hey, anyone got an extra backyard? Like, we'll give you veggies all year round. We'll do all the work for you. And we had like 10 people within a week offer up their yard. So um, it's been really cool to see, you know, kind of how excited people are. And I think how much people understand that, like, yeah, if I've got this yard, why shouldn't it be growing food? And um, volunteers, especially during the pandemic, uh, were really excited to kind of come out and um, help us prep the gardens. Everyone wants to get their hands dirty. Everyone wants to learn about growing their own food. Um, so that's been really cool. We've worked, uh, like I said, Darren was doing free farm stands in his neighborhood. He does some CSA scholarships. And then uh, he had a partnership with an organization called Comunidades Unidas, which just provides all sorts of services for um, uh, immigrants here in Salt Lake City. And this year we are actually applying for more funding. Our state has um, $2 million to give out through uh, a local food procurement assistant grant, assistance grant. And so basically they have $2 million to give to groups who want to buy food from disadvantaged farmers, which counts as most of our small farmers, like anyone that's under 35, anyone that's in a low income area or been farming for less than 10 years. Um, so the money goes to buying food from those farmers, making sure that they get paid fairly for what they're growing. And then the groups have to donate it for free. So we were like, oh, this is kind of what we're already doing. Like, can we just uh, maybe apply for this and up the scale a little bit. So we've reached out with a few other to a few other community partners. Um, there's a group here called Catholic Community Services that does kind of refugee services as well. Um, and then they have an Islamic center that they're affiliated with that also serves refugees. So um, that application is in process. But yeah, it's just been amazing. Like I think um, that program could probably grow depending on how you know many volunteers. Like the interest is is really high. So that's been cool to see. Wow. Um, and then Jeanette's project, Jeanette is like fantastic. I am so glad you got to hear from her. So she, Jeanette Padilla, runs the Food Justice Coalition, which is here in Salt Lake. Um, she's got like such a amazing background. I don't even know all the things, but some culinary background. And so she'll get food that I think is mostly donated from local farmers or she kind of gets a mix of donations and then they prep it, they chef it up, they do these amazing meals um, and then they give them out on the street to our unhoused population. Um, and her kind of philosophy is that, you know, these people deserve healthy, beautiful, well-prepared food just like the rest of us do. Like they don't want to just go to the food bank or get whatever scraps you have or eat donuts every day, you know, like they deserve right. healthy food. And a lot of them have chronic conditions and so they need this you know more than anyone mm -hmm. um so she's amazing um that program she's only been around for a couple of years and so she's actually also started to do a um just free lunch program for the community during COVID she was like you know what everyone needs a good healthy free meal once in a while so they do that um but it's just been so inspiring through the food coalition i feel really lucky i most of the time just get to like reach out to people doing cool things and be like hey what's up like tell me about your food project can we work together and um uh, yeah yeah it's been really cool so this podcast will be seven in october and honestly at this point it's just because i've just enjoyed talking to people right I get like you like i was like getting her on the podcast like i gotta yeah. get down on the podcast and talk about what you're doing and Oh my goodness, it's just so much fun to learn and just see people doing good in the world and just sharing that message. Oh my goodness. It's so fun. And especially with food, like it's oh, so, yeah. sometimes you kind of feel like you're alone. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you and I both now have like networks of folks that are into plant-based and food mm -hmm. systems, but um, sometimes with family or friends, you know, it feels like no one cares. No one's paying attention. There's a new fried chicken joint that opens up like every other week. And I'm just like, come on, <laughs> you do not need another fried chicken chain. Like nobody gets it just because like the food system's spiraling out of control. But um, right. when you do connect with, with folks that are, you know, interested in local food, plant-based food, it's like so soul enriching. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 a it is really fun. Like eleven years ago, when I first discovered a plant based diet and trying to figure out how to put this in your practice, it was just like 
you do. You feel like you're the the lone wolf in the forest, right? You're howling. Yeah. Like, anyone live near me? You're like, please, anyone? And <laughs> please help back so I can find you. <laughs> yeah, and um, you really do yeah. have to have like the community around you to sustain it. I found yeah. like um, well, people to eat with, and yeah, honestly, I think I was. Um, I yeah, I don't know. I feel like I was just like, this is the what was happening when you start seeing. You, 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 when you take the blinders off, there's no going back. So for me, right. seeing one patient in heal and then another, then another, and another, for me, I didn't matter if I was the only doctor who ever did this, I was not going to change because right. it was just, it was in my soul. It is so deep. Like, honestly, you know, you always hear people go like, well, what if you're on an Island and there's only a pig and you're going to starve to death. I was like, well, I guess I'm going to starve to death. You're like, honestly, and that's how the, that's how the story ends. You know? yeah, I was like the end. <laughs> that's yeah. a great one. I'm like, huh? Well, the pig is eating something. So let's go see where the pig's eating. Right. And so, you know, I guess I was like, also like, you're not going to be on a desert. Island. Exactly. You With, know, like, you know, it's just hilarious. These, you know, people are like, oh my goodness, let's, let's, let's go. Like, they just want to see how far of an extreme you'd go. I'm like, we're missing the big picture here. Let's <laughs> being right. on the desert island means nothing to us right now. Let's talk about the actual Let's talk issue. about real life. I know <laughs> I get frustrated with that too. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So that's fantastic. So where would you like to see, you know, the future of these organizations? Like what would be a wonderful ending to the story? And then how can people reach out to you or, you know, look into their own communities like where would those resources come from yeah um that's a great question so one of my big ideas starting the food coalition was to eventually connect plant-based utah and like the healthcare world to local agriculture so i was kind mm -hmm. of like well let's build up this community of local farmers figure out you know what's going on in the local food system so that we can have this channel and try to push our healthcare institutions towards sustainable agriculture, local food. Very yeah. much inspired by the work that Scott Stoll's doing with regenerative healthcare and um, the Rodale Institute. So I would love to see that happen. I think it's kind of just a matter of like, you know, okay, we push the education over here with healthcare providers and push the food system over here. Um, I mean, the big dream, which is something we're actually talking a lot about is, okay, how can we, for the lake and the food system, like providing um, access to markets, you know, support for small farmers by um, encouraging uh, more plant-based, you know, legumes, like can we get farmers mm -hmm. to grow beans, lentils, things like that, and then can we connect those to local market. So there are a couple, like there's a Wasatch cooperative market that's not yet open. And then a friend of mine mm. who was scheduled to speak at the symposium, but unfortunately got COVID. She is opening a market car called Marcellus Foods, um, which she eventually wants to take nationwide, but she's starting here in Salt Lake. Um, her kind of model is sourcing locally as much as possible. Initially, it'll probably be regionally, um, a lot from California, um, but then prepping the ingredients so she did a bunch of research on why people aren't eating healthier and cooking at home. And it's it's really the time for most people. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to cook. And so she's like, okay, well, what if we did the prep for you? So they're taking local ingredients and then minimally processing them by basically either just chopping or roasting. So you'll go into the store, you'll buy a container of chopped and or roasted carrots, onions, whatever, and then you can kind of make them into meals. Um, her business model is pretty flexible. And so she can kind of uh, offer whatever the local food system is supplying. And so mm. I would love to see us be able to channel farmers um, switching from alfalfa, reducing some of their water consumption, um, growing something new, and then having a market to sell it locally. Um, we've talked a lot about like, if we're able to kind of do that on the farmer end, can plant-based Utah um, offer some, you know, leg education on like beans and legumes and why these are such a great, um, you know, thing to eat for health and climate and mm -hmm. things like that. But I really do feel like we're on the right track. It's just like local agriculture food systems have, is not really something that a lot of people are thinking about. And so just continuing to have these conversations, continuing to bring healthcare providers, you know, farmers, water advocates and policymakers to the same table to just realize like, what the situation is. Um, mm. 
I hope that's a, <laughs> I hope no, that's I a love it. Um, where, so you, you know, you just started finding phone numbers and calling people or emailing, where would you say someone is a high, um, a very capable resource that someone's going to be able to find, you know, like the first nugget and then they go follow the trail. Like, so like in their own find state, a, maybe. Yeah. Like what are some okay. So resources? what I started to do, like all of the public meetings, I think in most states, you know, whether it's city council meetings, state legislature, a lot of those meetings are open to the public. So hmm. I started attending, our state has a local food advisory council. And I just started going to those meetings and being a fly on the wall. Cause I was just like, what are our leaders talking about when it comes to local food? And that's kind of where I realized that no one was thinking broadly enough. No one was thinking about health um, or local food security. So I would encourage people to maybe look at whether you have a local food policy council in your city um, whether your state has any local food bodies. I mean, most states have, like Utah's literally the Wild West when it comes to local food systems. We're kind of far behind the rest of the country when it comes to like our local food infrastructure and organizations. And so most states um, have, I think, more robust organizations than we do. So uh, the Food Systems Leadership Network is also a great resource. Um, they connect with you know, coalitions around the country, they would be a great place to go to see like, hey, does my state have something like this? Or just Googling like whatever your state or city is, you know, food council, food policy, reach out to your state representatives and ask them if they know of any like task forces. Um, that's really been my, my approach is just like, attend these public meetings. Sometimes I'll show up and it's like all these older gentlemen that are just like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm just here from the community wanting to hear what you guys are talking about. And um, they're not always used to that, but it's like a total normal thing. I mean, that's civic engagement, you know? I would encourage everyone to kind of see how they can get involved in local government um, or going to any, if you know of any food organizations in your community and asking if they are connected to other groups and just like are people thinking at the systemic level and um so i'm curious do you see yourself running for political office <laughs> or you know doing something like that yeah that's funny this is like the third time i've had this question this week um <laughs> i go back and forth so initially when i moved back to salt lake you know with policy it's kind of like okay you go to dc and you do federal policy or you do local policy there's of course some in between there but i always love the idea of local because it's you know the community element and you get to meet your neighbors and so when i first moved back i was like i love the idea of being the mayor like i think that mm. just sounds really fun um but then i was kind of like well all i really care about is like food and climate and i <laughs> i wouldn't want to have to divide my attention and so I've gone back and forth, but um, more recently, I'm like, okay, maybe I would consider like city council, see how that goes, and uh, yeah, see what happens after that. But I'm definitely interested. Um, it just depends on, yeah, I think the timing and food is always like my first and foremost passion. And so I think if I'm able to really lead with like, let's talk about food more in the state government or city government, then I would mm -hmm. consider it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think it's only going to be through people like yourself, young people who step into those leadership roles to start the conversation on another level. Because when you have the right. authority, you'll have the, the the knowledge, the resources, and that'll spark interest of other people. And so, I um, mean, it just goes up from there. So I would encourage, I'm just going to throw out my opinion. Like <laughs> I, think I'm gonna, I, like, I think I'm going to go, go for it. it. We'll see. But yes. yeah, I think awesome. I'm, I've just been so frustrated by like how few people are talking about food. And I'm like, okay, fine. If I got to get in there and do it. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, I mean, you already have the gusto. So it's just, it's just a matter of time that you're not yeah. going to be able to contain yourself. I mean, it's right. just, you right. might as well just own it and just go for it now because it'll, it'll totally. shorten your, your pathway to your, your end goal. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh. That's fantastic. Well, Chandler, I want to keep you at your at the hour, which I promised I'd keep you. Um, I appreciate this. And any final words that you'd like to share with the audience? Because I think this is great. Uh, I don't think so. Just thank you so much for having me. It's been a privilege to yeah. be able to kind of share about all the different things going on. Um, if I were to like offer, oh, come on, I've got to have some advice or something. But I would just encourage people to, if they're interested in getting involved, just you know, get curious, don't be afraid to reach out and just like 
enter as a newcomer. You don't have to know anything about anything to get involved. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think that was a hesitation of mine in the beginning is I was like, oh, I've got to be an expert on the food system to ask questions. And it's like, no, you don't. Like the people in public office, that's their job. So you can go just go in there and kind of prod and ask questions and, you know, tell them, tell them what they should be doing. But um, yeah, get curious. I love it. Release your curiosity because really curiosity is uh, is such a superpower. All right, it, yeah. it'll it opens doors for you and it feeds the dopamine because you're learning and it's just it just keeps going. Absolutely, but. and I kind of it was like a a big moment for me this last week when thinking back to like spring of 2021. I I remember the day that the governor you know said or announced we were in like an emergency drought situation or I forget what he called it, but um, that was the first time I became aware that 80% of our water is going to agriculture. It's alfalfa. And I was just like, so depressed. And it was like, what are we going to do? We've got to do something. And then kind of zooming forward to this last weekend, um, uh, being able to have this conversation about water with these alfalfa farmers. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like exactly what I wanted to do. So, uh, yeah, if you're thinking about something or worried about something or think something needs to change, you can do it. You can be the one that raises the alarm I think and yeah it you know and I don't want to get all you know foo foo on but this, oh I love that it, yeah <laughs> but I'm going to say the word manifestation right and it's it's mm -hmm. not the manifestation like it just oh I'm thinking and it's going to happen but what it is is that you're directing your focus on something that's important to you that feeds your passion that you feel like you know there's something there you can contribute and what happened all of the your brain's like oh okay it's like when you go to buy a new car I'm going to look at a Volvo. Well, suddenly everyone's driving a Volvo, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, I want to buy a yellow dress. Well, now I, all I see are yellow dresses because your brain's like, oh, well, let's pay attention to the environment of what's going on. And before you know it, you just keep working <laughs> the opportunities in front of you and things are going to manifest. Things are going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it start. it all starts with paying attention. Like I think, yes, the reason a lot of our crises have gotten out of control is just because we haven't been paying attention. Like that's exactly. kind of what I talk about with like our water crisis is I'm like, you guys, this is not because mm. the government doesn't work or the government is bad. This is because we've not been paying attention to what they're doing. We've not been involved ourselves. So it's just right. like, I think as soon as everyone pays attention to whatever it is they care about or they're passionate about or they feel called to do, um, I think we'll see a lot of good stuff. Absolutely. And I, yeah, we, and the same thing in healthcare, right? Your health, it's, you've literally walked away, turned away from what you're doing to provide your health. If you're dealing with a chronic disease, like type two diabetes or heart disease, yes, there's a small genetic piece of that, but it's really the lifestyle choices. We've ignored it. We've turned it over to big agriculture, the big <laughs> fast food drive throughs yeah. and walking away from learning how to teach, you know, or learning how to cook or teach our children how to cook. And I mean, it's just, there's so much, could, but it is <laughs> paying attention. Yes. Yes. I love it. I could yes. go on, on and on forever, but something that just came to mind when you said, like, you know, we've turned over our food to big agriculture. I think this idea that everything needs to be convenient has really like mm. led us astray and like, right. oh, you know, quick, it should be fast. And I know we all work so much and we have little time. And so um, no, we choose to have little time. We, we, choose, we yeah. choose. You know, yeah. yes, yes, we are all busy. I went to medical school with three kids, but I still was able to cook and put three meals on. You know, they had food. Yeah. I had help, yes, but I wouldn't search for this. But, you know, we make a choice to brush our teeth every day. We make a choice to go to the bathroom. We make a choice to shower. Mm -hmm. We make a choice to get dressed and go to work. It really is a matter of choice. So if you put it at your priority, you're going to find a way to do it. And I mean, some of the most successful people are some of the most busy people I've ever met. You know, they almost, I remember someone saying to me once when I started really getting into like online and businesses and learning all this marketing, it's like, if you really want something done, give it to a busy mom. Moms will oh, make I, yeah. happen. Oh, absolutely. Hands down. So yeah. it doesn't mean that you have to neglect your health or do these things, but if you should make your healthier priority or food in the healthy, because if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. I really feel yeah. that way. And um, yeah. And I, I just love to challenge convenience as a value. You know, it's like, yes. oh, there's yes. so much beauty and like connection. And if I'm stressed out, like the number one thing that gets me back 
and centered is like cooking a meal and like going to the grocery store, going to get it from the farmer's market and, you know, taking that time to really kind of unwind. And so this idea that like everything needs to be fast and easy, it's like, for what? Like, so that you can go watch TV or like go look at your phone or something. It's like, why are we rushing all of these things that uh, we could find so much joy in? Right. Absolutely. And honestly, I tell you some of the best memories of was when we were busy and we took the time as a family to cook and share a meal around the table, because honestly, that's what you're going to look back on at the end of your life. Those are the memories. It's not going to be, you know, watching the, oh, I deep dive into the Netflix series that was hot that week, or I was scrolling through my phone doing the death scroll, right? You know, that is not what you're going to remember. You may remember it's like, oh my goodness, I wasted so many hours of my life doing that. But it's literally the same time that you're doing that stuff. You could be investing in wonderful memories and building traditions and building a different trajectory for your life, your memories, your family, your health, oh, so much of it. Absolutely. But yeah, it's interesting. It's funny because people go, how did you do that? Like, how did you get to medical school? How did you, as like, cause I said, I made a choice. Yeah. I mean, and I that's kind choice. of similarly how I feel about like, you know, this food coalition work, this great Salt Lake yeah. work is people are like, how do you have so much time for this? Or like, how do you make time for yourself? I'm like, this is what I've chosen to do. And it's, I don't know. I think people have this idea that activism or organizing like this is just like all work. And it's like, Mm -hmm. a lot of the times I'm hosting a potluck on the weekend and like making friends. And so it's really fun. Um, Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it is, it is a choice to kind of invest in the things you care about and your community over, uh, and it, like you said, it's a joy. So it's not it's like- It's a joy. There's so, that's what I always not tell work, people. I'm, right? like, I'm like, don't worry. Like, don't be afraid. You're going to make friends. It's going to be so fulfilling. Like I, my life is so much better since I've started doing this just for, to have folks to like share your, you know, concerns with and work together and problem solve and laugh and exactly. cry. And like, it's exactly. community. Exactly. <laughs> I know that's a wonderful place. To it. It's community. Yeah. So make a yeah. choice to be- in your community, local, state, or wherever you may find your community. Maybe it is online. Um, But Chandler, thank you so much for your time and your enthusiasm. And I'm super stoked to see where you go in your future years, 10, 20, 30 years from now. I'll be getting older by then, but I'll I'll still think it's just a wonderful thing to, to see where you're going. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. I feel like we could go forever, but this was so fun. (laughs) Thanks for watching. And I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com. And thanks again for watching.